Welcome to Do It For The Gram, an Enneagram podcast with your host, certified Enneagram coach, Milton Stewart. What we do it for the Enneagram, not Instagram, we make moves to improve our lives and those in our community. As you know, we are on the Instinct uh, series, and so this is going to be the last instinct I'm talking about, which is the sexual instinct. And so we're going to break that down. Let's go intro music. Super excited to announce my new partnership with BetterHelp. This episode is actually sponsored by BetterHelp. If you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off the first month when you sign on using trybetterhelp.com forward slash do it. So I'm super excited uh, about this partnership that me and BetterHelp have um, entered into because in this point where everything that we're doing right now to connect with people is more virtual, it is so important mental health. I think that aligns perfectly with things that we're trying to do, things that I want to do, and um, anybody that I would refer or think that could be potentially beneficial to the audience. And I think BetterHelp is definitely one of them. BetterHelp is basically, it's online counseling or therapy. So you're able to actually get some counseling or therapy uh, depending on what's going on from licensed counselors and therapists around the country. And um, you get to be able to get some of that one-on-one mental checkup that you may need and BetterHelp's able to help you. So just go to trybetterhelp.com forward slash do it and you'll get a 10% discount for your first month. All right. So what are instincts? So if you haven't listened to the other two episodes and you was like, I'm just going to catch my instinct, my dominant instinct and listen to it. Instincts are that uh, animalistic part of us. It is depending on survival, your personal survival, your intimate group or understanding that groups and the wolf pack is bigger than oneself or it's the intimacy um, one on one connection that's very important as well. We have all three of those instincts and instincts are the first to react in a situation before our brains, before our emotions even hit, our um, instincts are actually happening first. Our instincts all live in our gut area, stomach area, belly, lower belly, the gut. Um, all of us have all these instincts. We just have some, we have one that is dominant. We have one that operates pretty decently in a healthy way. And we have a repressed one that does not operate well and also gives us pointers on something that we should be working on or looking at and observe. Instincts are do not negotiate. Remember, they're instinctual, they're animalistic, so they're, they're not there to be negotiated with. You have to lead them, manage them, and control them um, because they're not something that's just going to be like, well, if I kind of do this, nah, instincts don't work like that. So why are instincts important? Their instincts are important because you have to remember that in order to really improve in life, you've got to understand behavior what's going on with you in your body. You have to manage that because when we're triggered, some really weird and crazy things happen and we do not make the best choices for ourselves and those around us, though it feels like we're making the complete right choice, which is tricky. So when we're triggered, when our instincts are triggered, we go into a mode that's very unhealthy for us and sometimes the people around us that we care about. And so also instincts happen before your type happens. So a lot of times, if you don't understand this completely, your instincts happen way before your type structure even gets there. No matter if you are one through nine, your instinct is going to hit first before your type gets there. So you're going to want to make sure you understand how that instinct is working throughout your life so that you actually be able to pay attention to it, manage it, lead it and control it so you can make better choices going forward. All right. So what is the sexual instinct? So the sexual instinct, I'm going to use a definition from the Enneagram Institute because I think they do a really good job of explaining it. So many people originally identify themselves 
as this type because they have learned that sexual types are interested in one-on-one relationships. But all three instinctual types are interested in one-on-one relationships for different reasons. So this does not necessarily distinguish them. The key element in sexual types is an intense drive for stimulation and constant awareness of the chemistry between themselves and others. Sexual types are immediately aware of the attraction or lack thereof between themselves and other people. Further, while the basis of this instinct is related to sexuality, it is not necessarily about people engaging in sexual acts. There are many people that are excited to be around for reasons of personal chemistry that we have no intention of getting involved. Nonetheless, we might be aware that we feel stimulated in certain people's company and less so in others. The sexual type is constantly moving towards that sense of intense stimulation and juicy energy in the relationships and in their activity. They are the most energized of the three instinctual types and tend to be more aggressive, competitive, charged, and emotionally intense than the self praise or social types. Sexual types need to have an intense energetic charge in their primary relationships or else they remain unsatisfied. They enjoy being intensely involved, even merged with others and can become disenchanted with partners who are unable to meet the need of their intense energetic union. Losing yourself in a fusion of being is the ideal here. The sexual types are always looking for this state with others and with stimulating objects in their world. So with the sexual type, you're going to want to think about it as I gave this example in the social episode, if you're looking at countries and you're thinking about people as a whole and countries that reflect these instincts, so the sexual instinct would be more reflective of the Latin American culture. It is more uh, more of an intense relationships with people. There's an energy, a chemistry among people. The Chinese or Asian culture would be more of the social type. Uh, more looking to what's the best for everyone in this sphere, what's the best thing. And then Westernized society, Europe and America, are more or less the self-preservation type um, instinct naturally as a whole. And so if you're looking at different um, ideas of how that looks for different types. So facts about sexually dominant types. People of the sexual variant are very much interested in one-to-one contact. They are looking for intimacy, and this may show in sexuality, though not necessarily. Being in a relationship is very important to them. They are the most passionate of the subtypes, being temperamental and having more energy. They have less of a problem with getting into a fight and care less about rules and responsibility. So this is very interesting when you think about sexual types. They long, not even long, they they, they crave that intimate that chemistry among people, that close compatibility um, with people. And so when they aren't able to get it, it drives them a little crazy. And because they have so much energy and they want that connection so bad, they can look a little bit out of sorts. This can be very tough for sexual dominant types because if they are trying to get close with a person who's self-prayers, especially a self-prayers type, it can be difficult because a self-prayers on the onset will naturally start to move away from them. As they move closer and closer, the self press is moving further and further away. Social types are give the kind of in-between where there's moments where there will be like a, such a chemistry and such a click at times, but then there's other moments where the social type wants to be with groups and not just that person. So they start to move away from that. And that can feel very... Almost, I would say, internally, maybe painful for the sexual type because they feel the disconnection. And though it may not be personal to them, as in the person moving away or like moving back or withdrawing may not be something like personally trying to get at that person. At the same time, it feels really damaging to the person who's a dominant sexual type. So they have to be very careful uh, because they want the connection so bad that it makes them that they're triggered. Now, remember, this is an instinct. So when an instinct is triggered, now they're kind of off the rocker trying to get that relationship or do something so intense to make sure that they can be connected with that person. So some examples and traits of sexual types would include some of the traits would include like attractiveness, intimacy, intensity, connection, possessiveness, glamour, 
eye contact. One thing that's, that sexual types, you can kind of differentiate them between other um, types is that they make this crazy amount of strong eye contact. It almost throws you off if you're not like a sexually dominant person because you'll be having a conversation and that eye contact will be so strong. You'd be like, oh, wow. Um, can I look? Can they look somewhere else? Because they I feel like they're really trying to look in my soul. It's kind of creeping me out a little bit. So that's one definite trait of someone who's dominant in the sexual type. That eye contact is something serious. Um, relationships, desires, sex, or abstaining from sex. Remember, sometimes the one thing that people um, are super serious about or what seems like to be a driving force can also be the opposite. It's very interesting how that works. Um, excitement, beauty, and mating. These things are very, um, these are some traits that they tend to have. And so here are some of the things that um, are also important when it comes to sexual types is there's an evolutionary drive. And what I mean by that is like passing on genes, legacy, lineage, looking at those type of things can tend to be uh, very important to them. And something also that uh, Mario Sicoria, Sicor, man, I mess his name up every time. Um, but his definition for this type is called, he calls it transmitting instead of sexual. He thinks it describes it better. I have yet to get into it where I can definitely get into it. And transmitting sounds like such a weird word to say for that. It's basically the same thing we've been going over, but it's a connection. It's like, I want to be in connection with somebody because I want to transmit information and love and a deep rooted connection. So it's, it's, Along those lines, but it just sounds a little different and off. And also, the sexual type is also known to one to one to try to help people understand it a little bit better and not just think purely like, oh, this person just wants sex because that's not exactly it. Um, but also moving on. So some of the other things is passing on traditions, beliefs, values, and interests, intimate connection with the individual at a time, immersion, surrender, becoming one with someone. That's a huge thing with them. That intensity, that fire that sexual types have, they want to become like one with somebody else. They want that, that true deep union and fusion of the two people. Uh, most intense usually, like I said before, the eye gaze and the stare is something serious. Um, deep connections, one-on-one -on -one bonding, um, and procreation. And so some of the things they're focused on creating, maintaining a powerful sense of that sizzle through intense and intimate interactions and experiences that they can have with people. And so some of their priorities, as we alluded to before, is intimacy. I'm going to keep saying that so people understand it's not just one-to-one -one relationship. It is an intimate relationship with someone, uh, which is very important to them. And that's cool. Like as a self prayer seven, that's cool when you find somebody for that moment that really wants to be there and listen and think about it, all these great things. It's just like, but for me, it's a lot. There's a moment where I'm like, okay, time for me to go do me and be me. You do you. Um, and so that can be difficult for um, sexual dominant types. And some of their characteristics, healthy sexual types will often have deep, deep, deep passions, and they aren't afraid to try new things. The instinct drives them to create truly intimate connections, there they were, go again, with those they love and to connect with love itself. These types are more in search of chemistry than the sexual act, though they do seek an especially powerful connection with their intimate partners, okay? Does your workplace stink because the culture sucks? Are you tired of tolerating people and wish you could all work together cohesively? Does going to work give you instant anxiety? If you say yes to any one of these, you should probably quit your job. But since you aren't going to quit your job, you should call Kaizen Careers. At Kaizen Careers, we are all about improving personal and workplace performance. We use a unique tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram helps individuals and organizations become more self-aware. That self-awareness lends into helping organizations with communication, leadership, and conflict management, ultimately turning self-awareness into self-mastery and creating healthy workplace performance so you can improve your services and bottom line. You can reach Kaizen Careers at kaizencareers.com or 901-334-1644. Weakness. So some of the weakness of sexual types can be sexual types practice an exploratory approach to life that can lead them to a lack of focus as well as neediness and promiscuity which is interesting as well. Because they're searching so hard and so like when they're unhealthy for this deep, deep connection, like I said before, here's when it goes awry. It doesn't go the right way. 
when they're not able to get that connection, now they are out there seeking that connection so strongly that they aren't focusing on the things in themselves that they need to work on and caring about themselves. They're really caring about so hard with like connecting with someone else. And that's what can be very difficult for the nine, for the two, for the four. If you are sexually dominant type, it can be very challenging because all of those already have a codependent or emerging type of thing, or they're looking and longing for some deeper connection naturally. So when you add on top of it being sexually dominant, now you've added in a whole different element of trying to find this really, really deep connection. Also eights too, I would say, um, as well. And so you add those and then you add the instinct on top of the passion that all of them have. And now you got this interesting cocktail of something that's not very healthy, uh, for the type or for the person in this situation. So that can be very damaging and troubling if they don't, if sexual dominant types don't watch out for it. So when they are balanced and imbalanced, they are aware of, of attraction. They're both of what we are attracted to and our own power to attract. So they know how to do that. There are certain people how to make themselves more attractive to other people and they know how to do it very well. Um, they feel vital and alive, open to new experiences, willing to take risks, learn new things and and explore your edge. And so it's exploring the different parts by the edge. It means like kind of different parts of who you are and who they are in order to really, really get to know you. Um, ability to immerse oneself deeply, to merge energetically with lovers, to spontaneously flow with inspiration. And so it's really cool to be able to, in moments where they're able to completely connect with somebody, because remember, your instincts is in sensation in your body. So it is a good sensation when they can feel directly connected with somebody. And so it means a whole lot to them. So for us who do have dump, sexually dominant people in our lives, it is important to give them those moments, like make time to give those moments of deep intimacy because it really helps them. But also sexually dominant people remember that other types aren't able to give that intensity consistently like you may like it. And so that means there's time for you to work on yourself and pay attention to yourself and not so much to others. Sexually dominant lose themselves in intimate relationships and have a difficulty with the healthy attachment. So that becomes the, the, the counter issue to it. Like they want to connect so bad. They want to be so close. But now that they have connected with somebody, now they've lost themselves and it's not healthy for them. They have this unhealthy attachment and it's, it's just it looks really bad. Like it just looks really bad in the public eye kind of when you're like that. But it's also really bad for that person because they become like kind of toxic to themselves, worried about trying to be in this intimate relationship. Um, and trying to merge with the other person so hard. And they can become addicted to romance and excitement instead of um, understanding there's a balance in life of all the things that we like and understand and enjoy. But they can become addicted to it, to where that's all they're focused on their whole life. They're drowning in thinking about romance and excitement that it could possibly bring them. It can be a display of narcissism that they can have um, and or shame because of the cycle that they can go through. They can try so hard to connect or bond with somebody. And then once it doesn't happen, now they feel shameful for maybe the way that they looked to that person or people around them while they was going after this person. But at the same time, having a flair of you don't deserve me, you don't understand anyway, like narcissistic in their own type way because every type has a way that they can be narcissistic and so it looks very it looks a little different for each one but they have a total way of like trying to own back the way that they may have been unhealthy in a relationship and then you have um, obsessive tendencies or energetic deadness and so the obsessive tendencies is the the constant it's you know it's the constant doing things to try to see if there is a connection it's the constant maybe over texting somebody it's the constant um checking on checking in um doing certain things in a relationship saying certain phrases and different things to say are we connected are we connected um but it's a certain way that you know a certain person would do it and so it's tendencies that are obsessive that they can get stuck in because they're so intense and in trying to make that connection and then um energetic deadness is more along the line of they have a whole lot of energy, but it literally is getting them nowhere and it's literally doing much of nothing. But they have a whole lot of energy and they're not able to connect, but they're just kind of like a busybody almost, if that makes any sense. If you've heard that phrase before, just a busybody, just they're doing a whole lot, but it's a whole lot of nothing and it's not really for them. And it's like draining and their energy is off. And so you have to be aware of that too, um, sexual um, dominant types if you end up in that. 
Hi, I'm super excited to tell you about a partnership I just joined in on. As an Enneagram coach, I understand the Enneagram helps in all different aspects of a person's life. A part of that journey can only be helped sometimes by someone outside of themselves, someone in the profession of counseling or therapy. So that's why I partnered with BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp is basically a virtual way to contact and be in connection with counselors and therapists around the country. And at this time that we're going through socially being distant and a lot of being trapped in our houses or different things, even though it can be wonderful, a lot of times we may need to express something that's going on or things may be arising inside that we don't understand how to deal with. And so BetterHelp is a wonderful, affordable way to receive therapy and counseling in your home virtually. So if you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off your first month when you sign on using trybetterhelp.com forward slash do it. That's D-O-I-T. So this information will be in the show notes, but this is a way if you do need some help, mental help and working through things and emotional things, BetterHelp can definitely help. So one of the best examples that I've heard of, because I know like when you listen, you're trying to figure out if you're trying to figure out like, am I sexually dominant? Am I social dominant? Am I this? Am I that? Whatever. One of the best examples I heard from Uranio Pius at um, his and Beatrice Chestnut's workshop, where he talked about for sexually dominant types, when they come into a room or place or they're at a room or place and someone new comes in, there is like this color filter almost. There's people who light up who have color and there's people who don't have color. And the people who do have color which is using like maybe one or two people, they want so bad to go talk with them, to go engage with them, to talk, know them, to, to have that conversation and connect with them. And so there's everybody else looks like kind of bland. They, they'll go to a party like, ooh, that person right there, I really need to get to know them. And so they have the, the energy and intensity and the, and the drive to want to go and connect with that person. Like, ooh, I need to go talk to them, you know, um, because they're sexually dominant. And so it's one in that intense connection, like, oh my goodness, look, they seem interesting to me. And the issue with that is that what happens when the person they really want to talk to is consumed by other people? You know, what happens when the person they really want to talk to doesn't really want to talk to them? Or what happens when the person they really want to talk to withdraws from them after they've talked to them for a while? So that is an issue that sexual dominant types have to be careful of because it drives them when they're triggered. We got to remember, when we get triggered, that's when we start looking real crazy in front of people. And we start doing some real crazy stuff, overextending ourselves or over withdrawing, depending on your dominant type. But they start to overextend themselves and they try to come even closer at times and or they go the narcissistic route. So you have to be careful because now you've stretched yourself so crazy because your instinct is triggered that now you're trying so hard to get this connection that you're all out of sorts and you're just like totally out of your element of who you should be and what you should be working on, which is yourself. And so it's very important for the sexually dominant types to remember that in your instinct, when it's triggered, you have definitely got to take a step back and breathe. And you've got to start to make sure you pay attention to yourself. It's very easy for sexually dominant people to pay attention to other people because they're trying to connect so deeply. But you have to remember and really be careful because that part of you when healthy is absolutely amazing. When you're managing your instinct of sexual dominance, it is amazing when you manage it, when you understand how to use it, how to how to tamp it down, like relax, I got this, you don't have to act like that. But when it goes awry and goes crazy, now you are literally pushing people away from you instead of making a connection. And so the biggest thing is making sure you work on yourself and understanding that you are important enough to actually be intimate with yourself. And that's going to sound a little crazy, but like actually spending time to be intimate with yourself and not just with other people, finding out who you really are and enjoying that person and spending some of the extra energy you have to connect with other people, to connect deeper with yourself is going to be extremely extremely important to your growth. Because if you keep letting that trigger of the sexual type get you, you're just going to constantly push people away. You're going to bring them in, you're going to go to them and grab them, and then your instinct is going to be triggered, and then you're going to push them away. Or you're going to like make them want to leave type of deal. And then you're going to be really upset. And so that energy is going to come out in a really weird uh, type of way that's going to get you the opposite of what you really want, which is that deep, intimate connection. So be aware of that. So here are some questions to ask if um, you may be sexually dominant. How important is it for you to have an intimate relationship? If you are married, how much attention do you bring to your partner? Do you prefer to spend time with your partner or close friends one-on-one, -on -one, or would you rather spend time 
with people in a group? What role does sexuality play in your life? Do you have a spiritual practice or place in your life where you transcend your normal state of personality? So all these questions are super important for sexually dominant types because you can kind of start to figure out if that's your thing. If if being like having a meeting one on one with someone is like so important, and you really enjoy it and it brings you life and energy and you're so enthralled, you're most likely a sexually dominant person. In your marriage, if you just bring a lot of attention to them, because, you know, people are different in their marriages and they like things different ways. And that's OK, as long as you both work that out. Uh, but how much attention do you constantly bring to them? You know, not just a conversation, but like something deep and something you get both get lost in talking about or watching or doing together. Um, and so looking at that and then um, talking about the spiritual practice, how much time do you spend? intimately with yourself. This is what I was talking about earlier. You've got to learn how to spend intimate time with yourself as well. And so here are some tips if you are struggling when you get triggered with that. And these are the same tips that would be very similar before. First of all, you've got to notice when it happens. And if you listen to the self press episode, when I talked about my self press being triggered with the food and the fish in the cup and all this stuff, if you listen to that episode, then when you start to realize it, you've got to learn to take a deep breath and stop moving forward and pause. You may need to remove yourself for a while because you're so intense sometimes for especially sexual dominant types. You may need to remove yourself from the room if you're able to or the place or like that person and really check in with yourself and why is it so important for you to want to connect so intimately with that person? Is that a sign of something that you need to work on within yourself? Are you avoiding something? Are you trying to add something to you that you feel that's missing? So you need to stop and be aware of that. When you get triggered like that, you need to take some deep breaths. You need to back away from the situation. And then you need to ask yourself questions and try to figure out what in the world is going on before I go in here and look crazy in front of these people. Because when our instincts go off and they don't, like when they're triggered, we all look a little crazy in our own different way. Uh, so we have to be very careful of that. All right. So that's all I have for this episode. And um, not too much, pretty quick episode, but I want to kind of get these instincts out because the next series is going to be subtypes. And subtypes is basically your instinct times your passion. And so you get this really interesting, weird cocktail of a subtype of your type, meaning that there's three different types of each number on the Enneagram. And so when you understand your dominant one, oh man, it does things for you. You see a way closer pattern to you than you've ever seen before. And along with that, also understanding that your repressed center, when you realize that as well, you realize that, oh man, like I am missing something. Something is wrong that I need to work on, or I'm struggling with something. I've neglected that um, instinct inside of me. And the only last thing too is that you ran some of the, the thinking behind instincts too is those with the sexual dominant type, there is some type of either issue, challenge, connection, or overly attachment to the parent, the mother, father, child relationship or the parent kid relationship. But it's three people. It's not like self prayers is usually like the mother figure issue or overattachment, the social is the father issue or overattachment type of deal. And then the sexual one is the kind of the three prong thing, kind of like somebody was trying to seek a deeper attachment from somebody else in that three prong relationship from mom, dad and kid or parent, parent and kid. And so they're trying to seek some type of relationship a greater one with one of those people. So there's either an overattachment or there is some real struggle or challenge within it. Um, that's some of the thinking that they have behind it, which makes some sense when you do a lot more deeper research into that, all that type of stuff. But there's just something else I want to put out here. And so the last thing is that podcasts are not free for podcasters, but they are free for listeners. And so I have a Patreon account um, if you want to help keep this podcast going so that I can make more content and have more time to do that and fully pay my podcast editor. Um, right now, I think we're at $87. I'm trying to get to $100 um, so that I'm able to take care of that free without having to pay for that out of sight of my own money so I can knock that out. You can go to patreon.com. You can donate as little as a dollar. I mean, it, 
That is, you know, it's not much. And so it's patreon.com forward slash do it for the gram. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash do it for the gram. Also, if you heard the episodes on sexual, self pres and social, and you still have no clue what your stack is, I do subtype interviews and um, you can contact me at Milton at KaizenCareers.com or go to my website, KaizenCareers.com. Actually put in kind of a request and so that um, we can get that connected and we can look at getting you an Enneagram interview so we can get your type, um, make sure we nail that down so you can have that subtype and understand yourself much more deeply. And then also don't forget, I am I'm going to start putting stuff on YouTube. And so I would love for you to subscribe to the YouTube channel that I have, Do It For The Gram. It's on YouTube now, uh, the episodes. And I'm going to start actually doing videos. I want to put some really solid information on the on YouTube about the Enneagram. I feel like it's a lot of stuff out there, but it's not 100% solid. Um, it's more jokey, jokey, mean, funny type stuff. And I'm all about using this as a growth tool and it being practical so you can get better in your life. So if you're a sexually dominant type and you're in a situation and your sexual instinct is triggered and you're about to do some real crazy, stop, take a deep breath and make a better choice. Do it for the gram, the Enneagram, of course. And we'll see you soon on the next series in Subtypes. Bye.